Hello and welcome to That Encyclopedia Podcast with your hosts, me, Will, and Jacob. Hello. So, sorry everyone, I've been very slow to prepare podcast episodes, although by the time you get this one, I might be on track again. We are now talking number 32, and today we'll be discussing IO. So, we're not quite talking about the mythological character from Greek mythology, one of the mortal lovers of Zeus, Io, a priestess of Hera, we are actually talking about something very relevant to a previous podcast episode. We are talking about Jupiter 1, Io, the moon, the innermost and third largest of the four Galilean moons. So we're talking about one of the discoveries that is often credited to Galileo Galilei. And yeah, let's jump right into it. Jacob, what is your what is your most interesting fact about the moon Io? <laughs> Uh, well, my most interesting fact about the moon Io uh, probably doesn't actually come from uh, the article itself, a bit controversially. Um, I was thinking of editing it to add an in popular culture section, uh, because uh, my fun fact for people would be that um, if they want to see some high quality renders of uh, Io, quite faithful renders as well, I should add, if uh, the descriptions in the article uh, match up to reality, um, then they should watch a show called The Expanse, which features the uh, first moon of Jupiter quite prominently in the first half of its third season, I want to say. Um, and it's quite special alongside Ganymede and the other Galilean moons. Mm. So it's a, a, a location that's close to my heart, really, um, as far as solar system locations go anyway not only because of the expanse but also because as you mentioned it was um, most likely discovered by Galileo there is another chap called Simon Marius um, who named the moon uh, so that 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 privilege is is his um, and recorded a, a discovery of Galileo one day of, of um, Io one day after Galileo did um, and also failed to publish uh, first. So uh, most likely was Galileo, but Simon Marius was very, very close as well. And ultimately the the moons are named uh, after his suggestions. Um, and of course that makes it relevant, to, particularly to the podcast, as, as you mentioned, because we've covered Galileo. Um, it's also an extremely volcanic planet. And we've discover, uh, discussed the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens as well. Um, so it's really a fusion of different things. And I think as the podcast continues and develops, this will become a more common occurrence as uh, more and more topics are covered seemingly at random, but there is a method to the madness. What are your thoughts on IO, Will? Yeah, so I really liked finding out more about this volcanic nature of Io. So I, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I don't know that much about, um, about other, other bodies in the solar system and out. I'm not much of an astrophysicist. Not that I haven't ever been interested in it. I, uh, again, linking, linking way back to, uh, to our discussion on Carl Sagan. I've watched quite a lot of shows featuring um, Professor Brian Cox touching on sort of astronomy and astrophysics and that. I've definitely been interested in that, in particularly uh, when I was a teenager. But this obviously also links in quite a lot with geography, as you mentioned, um, Mount St. Helens, volcanoes. There are a lot of volcanoes on Io. Um, and that uh, that's quite cool and it also links to some quite cool other things some other discoveries I made whilst reading about this so uh, one page that I just wanted to click on because it looked 
so cool was the Wikipedia page Lava Lake. So a lava lake is uh, so I mean everyone everyone can picture a lava lake I'm sure it's the uh, pit of molten lava often in the the crater or vent of a volcano but it's quite cool to look at pictures of lava lakes <laughs> in particular I thought there was quite a cool one showing Mount Erebus in Antarctica because that also helped me come to the realization that there there's actually um, more than one volcano in Antarctica which obviously makes sense Antarctica is fairly large but what also makes sense is this this volcano is completely covered in snow so if you take a satellite image of this volcano you get this big snow dome and then in the center you see this uh, this orange glow inside an otherwise black crater and I think it just makes a really cool image so that's Mount Erebus um, on Antarctica continent if you want to google that yeah so it's interesting I mean it, it, because I mean Io in in contrast is uh, lit up like a Christmas tree with volcanoes if you look at a, an infrared image which happily the article does provide um, the I think I read that it, it had at least um, well it has between 100 and 150 mountains of which at least 19 are confirmed to be active volcanoes although if you look at the infrared image that accompanies the article it looks like a lot more than 19 to me um, it looks like a planet that's just kind of first forming um, artistically rendered um, but in fact the, the level of uh, volcanism on Io is uh, caused by its uh, orbital eccentricity um, which is a measurement of uh, to what extent uh, the orbit of a satellite around a, a larger body deviates from a perfect circle so if it has an orbital eccentricity of zero then it doesn't deviate at all and it orbits in a perfect circle um, uh, and uh, basically because it's uh, quite an eccentric orbit around Jupiter um, it has a lot of tidal heating which has led to it becoming the most vol uh, volcanically active world in the solar system um, with Oh, okay, there you go. 19 volcanoes in the traditional sense, but then hundreds and hundreds of volcanic centers and mm. extensive lava flows. Um, there's a, a gif, or, or a, I think, yeah, technically it counts as a gif, of um, a few still images captured by uh, one of the many probes that we should discuss that have uh, recorded activity on Io over the years um, that shows a, a sequence of images of uh, the volcano known as Tvashtard, spewing uh, volcanic material, uh, material up uh, into the atmosphere of the planet, and its apex reaches 330 kilometers. So you can capture the whole planet from a distance, and it looks like it's wearing a tiny little hat. So large is the um, ejected matter um, from uh, just one of its 19 volcanoes so it's not exactly i would say a safe place to be um, because aside from the volcanoes you also have uh, an atmosphere composed almost entirely of sulfur dioxide and sulfur compounds which will be quite toxic to you um, it's also <laughs> receives 3000 rem of radiation a day um, it's also highly active magnetically mm. and in general is not a place conducive to life as we know it but nevertheless is a very uh, I would say noble satellite in the solar system it's about the size of the moon a little bit a tiny bit bigger I think um, and is single-handedly responsible for 50% of Jupiter's own uh, magnetic um, uh, magnetosphere as they call it, which is the extent of the measurable influence produced by Jupiter. Um, the uh, kind of amplification effect provided by Io doubles the size. Which, um, in, 
So it is, in a sense, the battery of Jupiter's magnetosphere. Yeah, in a in a sense of scale, it's actually very cool, and I think that's one of the cool things about when you start to think about space. So yeah, if you if you look, there's an image from the Cassini mission of Io in front of Jupiter, and you can see how relatively tiny Io is. But obviously, Io is large enough to have formed looking pretty spherical to the human eye. It's still a fraction of the size of Jupiter, and yet it is, in electromagnetic terms, extremely significant to Jupiter. So, yeah, some pretty some pretty cool physics going on there. And it's also just a very handsome, uh, very handsome satellite. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't think the uh, kind of primary image of the article really does it justice, where it looks uh, quite sick, <laughs> with sickly greens and yellows and pale beiges and things. Um, and I suppose perhaps that was selected because it is the most accurate image in the visual um, spectrum or, or, or highest quality. But other images farther down show... Um, all of these kind of deposits of sulfur allotropes and uh, lithium and oxygen's uh, influence yeah. um, on the atmosphere and composition and uh, there's a geological map that's gorgeous as well so I think it's it's uh, um, and, and a particular one actually is, is kind of an RGB um, image that shows uh, auroral glows in eyes uh, Io's upper atmosphere. Um, you can see uh, red emitting oxygen, blue emitting from uh, sulfur dioxide and other volcanic gases, and then greens um, mm. that come from um, emitted uh, sodium. So uh, I think it's it's a very pretty planet. Uh, not planet. Satellite. <laughs> Planetoid. Speaking of the, the cool images on it, um, I, I absolutely agree that there's a lot of very cool images here. That's what's great about looking at space. <laughs> Makes for, for good visuals. But there's one here as well. Um, a, it's a five image sequence, a bit like a, a bit like a gif showing uh, Io's one of Io's volcanoes spewing material uh, 330 kilometers above its surface and you can just see how significant that is relative to the actual size of Io itself. Have you seen that one? Mm, precisely, yeah. but uh, yes, uh, yes, precisely. But can I just backtrack a little bit? Did you just say GIF? <laughs> well, I historically I use the term GIF, but I've been told by by many that GIF is, is the official. Is the officially recognised pronunciation? I mean, we can Google it. <laughs> I, I, I'm speechless. <laughs> I'm stunned. <laughs> I, I, I've said GIF my whole life. I feel betrayed. So there is a debate. I'm shocked. The, the developers of the GIF at computer CompuServe in the uh, in the 1980s said it was GIF. As, if, as in a J in the pronunciation, but others argue soft G is more common and acceptable. So, <clears throat> and others claim that the hard G is closer to the meaning of graphics. So, uh, th there's, I don't know, maybe I should just call it a GIF again, like I normally do. I just thought for the podcast I might put an effort in, but it looks like I was justified in what I <laughs> used to say. Uh, well, I'm, I guess the upside is that between us, you know, uh, uh, everyone will agree with at least one of us, at least on this particular. Well, I don't point. know. We, we've but now I, I know reached what. a consensus, though, <laughs> that we don't call it. Oh uh, no! <laughs> so, if you want to complain in the comments, <laughs> um, I completely sympathise with calling it GIF, as I always have done, and will now continue to do. So, deal with it. <laughs> okay. Um, now we've we've mentioned that Io is quite a pretty uh, piece of our solar system, but of course for the first, I guess, 
f- almost 400 years. Um, yeah, for the first 400 years of its uh, timeline in human history, since its discovery, uh, it, it wasn't really very pretty because it was just a an o- oddly bright speck of light in the night sky, if you could see it at all. Um, maybe we should discuss the observational history um, of Io a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, do you have sure. any 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 kind of comments on the development there? Yeah. So originally, it wasn't Io was not uh, initially. Uh, distinguished from another one of Jupiter's moons. Let me just find that. That's correct. Um, so, when initially observed, which was the other moon? Too much text on this page. Uh, Europa. <laughs> Europa. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, originally, it was quite difficult to to resolve. Uh, the the moons of Jupiter, obviously, hence around the time of Galileo and uh, Marius, they actually managed to document that there were moons at all. But before we'd established that Io was a moon in of itself, uh, it, it, it's quite close to another. It's quite close to Europa, so it just sort of looked like one bright blob but it was actually the two overlapping, as was shortly discovered. Um, but, yeah, I don't know how far to, to, to springboard from this, because the discovery of Io, um, before, well before we had s- such a diverse uh, selection of interesting images of it, it still was able to get some some quite prominent usefulness in science so <clears throat> it was yeah where am i going with this what did i read something about <laughs> you probably know what i'm talking about i mean it's been used it's been well, it's been used kind of uh, during the 17th century, uh, 17th century onwards, kind of um, as a as a, a an anchor point for certain mathematical developments yeah. in the history of science, particularly physics. So, like Kepler's third law of planetary motion um, uh, was kind of developed by utilizing Io um, and the observations that, that Galileo had made, and people had subsequently sort of verified um, the first estimate. Um, for the speed of light, um, yeah, that was one. I think, or well, one of them was um, determined by Römer. Um, it was the based on the length of time required for light to travel between Jupiter and Earth. Um, so Io kind of had a role in that. Um, we have the other uh, sister moons of Io, like Europa and Ganymede, um, have. <laughs> What uh, the 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 astronomers would call orbital resonance, um, which is satellite bodies influencing each other through gravity, um, and because the uh, Galilean moons are kind of quite large and close to each other, relatively speaking, of course, um, physicists and astronomers like Cassini or Laplace um, were able to develop mathematical theories to explain it, um, which of course necessitated that they first be <laughs> distinct um, objects in a uh, scientific body of knowledge. Um, but after that, we kind of have to fast forward by several centuries, because despite the achievements of Galileo, uh, Marius, uh, Laplace, Cassini, uh, and others, ultimately people wanted to see it right like people want to 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 turn it from something more than just a speck in the night sky and this is where several um i think about half a dozen different spacecraft come in um we have pioneer probes 10 and 11 voyager probes 1 and 2 
uh, the Galileo spacecraft, the Cassini spacecraft, the New Horizons spacecraft, the Juno spacecraft, um, and upcoming we have my favorite one, just because of its acronym, uh, we have the JUICE, which is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer, uh, which is a planned mission in 2023, which should arrive uh, around the Jovian system around 2031. Um, and we also have Europa Clipper, which is uh, a NASA mission rather than the um, uh, the Moon Explorer, which is uh, from the European Space Agency, um, which will focus on Europa, but will also do kind of flybys of Io. Um, and then finally, we have the Io Volcano Observer, uh, the IVO, uh, which was uh, a proposed mission but it looks like Da Vinci and Veritas uh, are going ahead first, so it's probably been shelved for now. But even still, we have two confirmed missions going ahead in the next decade or so, um, and they all provide us with even more high-quality images because the technology has gotten exponentially better. When you look at the first images of Io, they're kind of composite, and they have to be textured up a little bit, and the colours don't quite come through as much. I mean, they're still gorgeous and much better than just a uh, 20 times telescope that sees them as little more than points of light in the night sky. But uh, I think if there's anything I've learned from the spacecraft that have flown by Pluto over the years, it's that the resolution and quality uh, increases exponentially. So uh, the next spacecraft to fly by will probably give us some truly breathtaking uh, visual treats featuring Io. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's <clears throat> really interesting to think back to that time. I mean, we've, we've talked about history uh, in, in, these, in these terms before on the podcast, but just again, the, to imagine the, the time, right? We've got, it's the, uh, the early, the early 1610s. I mean, it is 1610, it's literally January, and you've got two men using fairly weak telescopes looking at the sky, and they're, all, and they're able to simultaneously discover previously unseen things to resolve new points in the night sky so it must have been f for them i mean in terms of being a, a scientist it must have been a very exciting time to be doing science because we we're, we're talking about the discovery of uh, i mean if you think about even like the, the scale of these objects they they they're celestial bodies this is although small relative to Jupiter, this is a big thing, and in t in terms of space, it's not very far away. So it's really fascinating to be able to start seeing these things in the sky, and to con contribute to an, an overthrowing of the previously understood model of how the universe itself was shaped. So. Uh, in a similar way to how we were talking about the the um, f sort of descent of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, that was a time of giants. But similarly, this was a time of giants when every every such um, scientific juggernaut appears to have <laughs> known or had a spat with another one, but. Yeah, as is the nature of the uh, the class system in history, I suppose. I agree absolutely. Um, you often see these days, every week, you know, a physicist publishes a paper, or uh, even an amateur um, takes a, a a composite photo or makes a discovery in a, an unobserved part of the night sky. I mean, space is so big um, that it's not very difficult to build uh, something that's capable of making new discoveries to science. Um, but so many of them are, uh, to, to 
for want of a better phrase, just so far away these days. Um, I, it's kind of, I mean, on the one hand, it's exciting, right? The ability to pierce farther back in time, farther uh, beyond the veil and see what else is out there in the universe. But on the other hand, there is a sense of homeliness to making discoveries within our own solar system. But I, I wonder if the early astronomers had a similar feeling, because of course, in mm. 1610, the solar system was really all there was. I mean, other stars were visible, but my understanding is that they had no way of really modeling quite how far away they were and there wasn't this conceptualization of you know a universe containing galaxies containing stars containing planets containing moons so yeah i suppose to galileo and marius io and jupiter must have felt about as far away as the center of the milky way does for us for all the difference it made so it's this double-edged sword True. i guess you know making discoveries <laughs> farther away is is a good thing in, in the pursuit of knowledge to science but at the same time it makes it makes everything else feel so sort of small <laughs> i guess so yeah i mean i hadn't considered actually that yeah maybe maybe when they were on this work maybe to most people it seemed uh, pretty pretty uh, nerdy and niche to be looking for objects that are supposedly very very far away when of course their understanding and mapping of the surface of the earth was pretty limited at the time i i think you've got to be that you've got to be a nerd to a degree right to be staring at, at what for what you for all intents and purposes are stars in the night sky i mean imagine like tapping on your shoulder and saying hey i'm gonna i'm gonna stay up all night looking at this particular star you say well why you say well it doesn't move like the others you know should and it's a bit brighter you know maybe it's not a star <laughs> he says what are you talking about i like uh, stars move no they don't they're just there in the night sky and you say no but they do move i have mathematical proof read my paper no one's reading that unless they're a fellow <laughs> enthusiast for astronomy right like it's common knowledge now but i think you're right at the time it must have yeah. been pretty niche the profession the profession itself yeah maybe was respected you know the, the observations were made at the university of um, padua and things but yeah. e even still um i think astronomy is is really in a golden age at the moment um and uh, it's easy to to let that color the lens when we look back through history at what astronomy used to be it has a, a, a quite an arduous history particularly with say the catholic church for example <laughs> mm. Mm. well even if the uh the series of discoveries themselves weren't super exciting which of course they may have been i think just being around at the time of the more extensive use of telescopes to look at the night sky in itself you know they must have known this this is groundbreaking that we can magnify things far away this much and look at them in greater detail i mean it's probably the reason why they were keen enough to study them in the, at all but yeah uh true yeah absolutely um fantastic well is there anything else about this article that uh, particularly stood out to you uh, before we before we wrap um i suppose that the uh, just a note on the the mountains there are a number of mountains on io and uh some of them are pretty huge the other, the other interesting thing is that they're not very similar to mountains on earth in the sense that mountains on io often appear as massive isolated structures so there's no obvious global tectonic pattern outlined as there is on earth um but yeah without without scouring i couldn't really it's difficult to give you a sense of the size of a mountain anyway other than if i was to to compare them to mountains on 
earth so mm. but there are mountains multiple mountains taller than mount everest so that for references they are they are quite large with that said i think that is my <laughs> sorry go on yeah no no i was just going to i was just going to add my my fun little fact from the article that i drew uh, very quickly the uh, penultimate paragraph um says that there is this interesting proposal about the behavior of the ionian atmosphere uh, it does say it's a proposal so it might not be uh, the case but uh, every time io passes behind jupiter it experiences an eclipse the sun gets blocked out because jupiter is so much bigger than it and it's so close to the planet um so we kind of lose sight of it for a bit um and it loses sight of the sun which means the surface temperature plummets by like 40 kelvin at mm. least um and every time it emerges again it experiences this phenomenon of post-eclipse brightening only for about 15 minutes and so the penultimate paragraph of the article suggests uh, suggests that what might be happening is something called um, phase transition deposition where the uh, gases in I uh, Io's atmosphere uh, freeze into solids without passing through a liquid phase um, and then after they're exposed to uh, the sun again after about 15 minutes um, it kind of sublimates which is the opposite where something goes from a solid to a gas uh, without going through the liquid phase uh, and this causes this kind of shine from the moon so uh, linking it back to the beginning when i was discussing briefly how um, hellish the environment is for you know say a human to try and explore um, you also have to deal with gases in the atmosphere turning into solid rock for a bit and then <laughs> transitioning back every time the temperature plummets and the sun is blocked by this ominous gas giant in uh, on the horizon that would be my final picture of io to paint for people mm. an intriguing image of an alien world for sure mm. and on that note well i think that is all we have time for this evening or this morning or this afternoon wherever you are i hope you had a good time and we'll see you next time <laughs>